In our very first story, there is a call in Parliament for the establishment of a committee of inquiry to investigate what led to the death of former Vice President Kwesi Emisata. NDC MP for Daklu Kwame Agboja says the health system failed the former Vice President in a way that is not acceptable. He also accuses the Defence Minister Dominic Nitiwul of inappropriately discussing the death of Emisa Arthur on an MPP social media platform. The MPP says the Committee of Inquiry should consist of medical and security officials and the committee's findings should be made public. This is a former vice president who we all know is fit and everything. I'm not saying fit people wouldn't die. But the circumstances that are being described to us, he was uh, on a, a, a treadmill or something and then he fell and then everybody panicked and then there was no ambulance they put him in the back of a pickup I'm not saying in a bucket, in the back of a pickup um, instead of an, in an ambulance and was he still conscious by the time he collapsed uh, was he alive before he was transported what happened in the vehicle when he was being transported was he alive when he got to the hospital who attended, where did they send him to what happened when they got to the hospital all these are questions we don't know about and I think that the best thing we would, have, we would have had was a government giving us a better information than what they've given us. I want the committee to investigate, not because we want to implicate anybody, but we want to have understanding. I'm sure if we wake up and there's a dead body or somebody seriously injured in my house, I am sure the police will question me. They would like to find out what happened, not simply because they believe I did it, but they, there's the, the need for certainty as to what happened. And I am calling for a level of independence inquiry so that we can understand because this can happen to us. Some of us are of the view that by now uh, knowing the caliber of person the vice president was, our culture precedent suggests that the government of the day, uh, being the NPP government under the president Akufuado, should have declared a state of mourning. Uh, this is done to just uh, carry the country along for us to reflect on what has happened. But sadly that did not happen. I don't know why it, that has not happened. Uh, I am of the view that there's still opportunity for the president to, to right the wrong. The country's emergency services have come under scrutiny in recent weeks, especially after revelations. Former Vice President Kwesi Misa Arthur was driven to the 37 military hospital in a pickup moments before his death. Ochehini Osaji Fuamwitu for repaying the second over the weekend said he witnessed attempts to resuscitate the former vice president last Friday at the Air Force gym and the helplessness of those who were at the scene in getting an ambulance to convey him. There's an excerpt of a Joy News documentary on the state of the country's ambulance service filmed in March last year. Officials in that documentary complain about the depleted fleet and how it is affecting their work. The ambulance system in the country faces some key challenges. Key among them is inadequate fleet. Most of the ambulances around my vicinity where I cover are broken down and I cover all the area. So as a particular time when we are supposed to be here, horse, you're supposed to be going for other cases. We are supposed to waste all that time here until we're able to get our trolley before we get back to base. And for you know, for all that time duration, other people might be wanting the service of the ambulance, which is packed here and so be able to get a trail. So you've relayed this information to the control room that you are unavailable within this period because you are waiting to get your trolley. Why can't you just leave the trolley and go? Uh, the trolley <laughs> is one of, it's very important because it's what you use to carry the patients. So without it you can't work because when you carry the patient, you can't leave the patient on the stand. You need a trolley to keep the patient on before you can do other stuff. It's, it's one of the most important things in the car. Without a trolley, the ambulance is nothing. Like, it's, it's empty. Ideally, there should be a main fleet and standby ambulances to serve the country. But this is virtually non-existent. Ideally, for every ambulance station, you're supposed to have a standby vehicle. When one leaves for emergency there's a standby or when it goes for um, maintenance there is a standby because we still have not been able to develop to a point where we have enough resources the standby vehicles normally do not exist so we rely solely on the main vehicle that is on the road some Ghanaians have accused the ambulance service of extorting monies from them before making their service available to them. But according to the service, what it takes from patients or their family members is for fuel support, and that is sanctioned. Um, please, are you a relative of the patient? Oh, okay. 
All right, okay. Thank yeah, you. Let me. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. So um, when you are about to go, let us the relative that um, mm. they will give a one fifty for the full support. Okay. When the ambulance, one fifty for the full support. Yes. So can we tell them when they agree? Then I'll let the ambulance come. Mm. If he's he, is he with you? Is a relative with you? Yes. You know the relative have to agree on the uh, amount. Mm -hmm. Whether, yes. they can afford, Whether they can afford or not, then we know what to do. That is why I'm please saying, I'm please me. tell I'm me. Then I I will talk to my OIC. Then we we'll know what we do about it. Normally, it will depend on the poly, the hospitals that will call, depending on where they are calling from, mm -hmm. and then we support something small for fuel. Mm -hmm. But for the charges, we don't charge. Higher. Let me say, if we take a case from Ridge Hospital to Kualibu, we support a fall of 50 Ghana cities. Okay. It's only when we are going for examination, let me say, scan, x-ray, and other medical. With that, those ones, you, you do that one. we do that one too. And there are some, it. yes, there are some patients that with their condition, mm -hmm. they can't sit. Okay. They have to lie in the trolley. So such patients, when they are going to do maybe head scan, abdominal skull or something, they have to be in the ambulance. And normally, you know, scans and those things, they have to book. Mm -hmm. So it's not like something that you just get there and then they will do it down for you. So that one takes a longer time. A longer time. So that is, that is the only difference that the charges changes. But for referral cases, and then when you call, and then you tell us that maybe you want to refer a case or something and you don't even have money hello, we still hello. make sure that we take the patient to the yeah, appropriate facility to be taken care of hello. so it's not compulsory that if there is no ambulance hello. Uh, hello. sorry hello. if you don't have money to pay we don't go we do make sure we take the patient to the receiving facility to be for a further medical care to be taken to. We'll be speaking some more about the state of the uh, country's emergency response system. Meanwhile, second Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Avon Bagwing, has also lamented the poor state of Ghana's health sector. He says it needs massive improvement. We're not taking our health sector seriously. I have said it and I will continue to say, there's no minister of state that can turn the se sector around within one year. But ministers of health are not allowed to stay true because the sector needs political leadership. There are so many things wrong with our health sector. And it takes at least one year to have a hold of what is in that sector. And that is the time the ministers are reshuffled. And you have a new minister learning all over. It's not easy. We need to prioritize health first, and our health is our wealth. It's very important, and so it's a lesson to all of us. Now, for the very latest on the state of the country's ambulance fleet, I'm joined on the phone by Foster Ansong Brejang, Head of Operations at the Ghana Ambulance Service. Also joining us on phone is Dr. Justice Yang Singh, General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association. Now, I'll start with you, Mr. Brejang. Could uh, the story of how the former Vice President died at the Air Force gym be in any different if the ambulance service was a lot more efficient or in a better state? <coughs> Hello, Mr. Brejang. Hello. All right, if you can hear me, I'm asking, uh, would the story of how uh, the former vice president died at the Air Force gym. Uh, been any different if the ambulance we service... Can't speak a bit louder. Uh, line very thin. All right. So I'm going to speak up a bit more. I'm asking if the story of how the former vice president died at the Air Force gym last Friday been any different if the ambulance service was a lot more efficient or in a better state. Hello? Yes, uh, Mr. Yes, the line was very thin. I couldn't hear what you said. 
Is it any better now? Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes, I can hear you. All right, so I'm asking, let's start off with the state of uh, the country's ambulance service. What okay. is the situation now? How many ambulances do we have? Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. As it has already been stated at the various fora, currently, National Ambulance Service is operating at our lowest level. In other words, we have just our 65 ambulances functioning across the country. Even though we are said to have about 130 ambulance systems. And for that matter, we are unable to respond to all cases as expected. All right, so you're saying that you have 55, 5-5 five, five functioning, right? Yes, please. Even though you're supposed to have over 100? Yes, please. So what's happened to the 50 plus? Yeah, the problem is that the vehicles that we are currently using were procured in 2011. And the kind of job that we do, running seven days in a week, 24 hours in a day, Basically, within five years, the vehicles have reached this uh, lifespan, and we need to have a replacement. And because we've not yet got new ambulances, the current one that we are using uh, continues to break down from time to time. And as a result of that, we do our best to maintain them, but it's rather unfortunate that most of them, the damage is beyond ordinary repairs, and engines, are broken down and because of that most of these vehicles are not functioning at the moment now if you had about 100 or all the ambulances you have you said about 105 if you have if you had all of them functioning efficiently would you say so what i'm saying is uh, the total ambulance station is over one is 130 and we have we initially have ambulances for all the, the stations all right but as we speak now some of the station's ambulances are broken down with some engine problems. All right. Result, so of the, the 130, if, if all 130 stations were functioning efficiently and effectively, how quickly could an ambulance have been deployed to the Air Force gym to get the former vice president? Well, in actual fact, the incident that happened at the Air Force base, National Ambulance Service was not called. We were not called, actually. Granted, but if gran we, granted. If we but had been called. Yes. Certainly, we have ambulances functioning within Accra. So we would be in a position to release an ambulance to respond to the emergency, even though it may have come from slightly uh, a longer distance. But we would be, we would be in a position to respond. So actually, how, if all ambulances are working, we have a station at the airport. All right. So the airport ambulance would have been the uh, the one which is closest to the incident point, which would have responded to the emergency. How quickly could it have reached there? I believe that from the airport to the uh, Air Force Base, I don't know if that is where the game is located, then I believe that it wouldn't have taken more than 10 minutes for them to reach there, if that ambulance is functioning. All right. Yeah. Now, please stay on the phone line uh, for us. We are also have on the phone line Dr. Uh, Yang Singh. Dr. Yang Singh, Justice Yang Singh, is the General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association. Now, I, I want to find out from you, Dr. Yang Singh, would you, what would you say about the preparedness of the country's hospitals to handle emergencies, especially with the many reports of people being turned away? Well, I mean, basically, you've actually answered the question. Many people are being turned away. So then it means that we have a problem. But, uh, Israel, let me put it this way. Let's not focus so much on just the hospital level. Let's look at it holistically. And by holistically, I mean emergency medical services or emergency medical response or emergency response. You see, which, starts, which is why we're looking at the ambulance service. Yes, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It starts right from the point of the incident whether it be it an accident, be it uh, somebody just falling ill, what have you. And then the processes will have to follow. There is a need for proper coordination and communication between, say, the ambulance service and the health facilities such that 
the ambulance will leave the point of the incident or accident, knowing that I am going to save Ridge Hospital. Ridge Hospital will then be in the know. They will be ready for him. It shouldn't be such that they pick the patient, they don't even know where they are going, they don't communicate with anybody. When I say they don't know where they are going, what I mean is where they will get a bed. They shouldn't just go to one facility, then they attend to the next, the next. It shouldn't be so. They should be able to communicate with media referral centers or the hospitals or health care facilities based on the need of the patient. The ambulance service personnel are trained such that they should be able to have a fair idea whether this patient needs to go to, say, a place as high as Kolibu or, say, a middle-level one like, say, Lekma or, say, um, even Ridge Hospital. All right. Does it yes. mean, so Dr. Janssen? That is important. Dr. Dr. Janssen, does it then mean that if the former vice president had been sent in an ambulance to 37, the possibility that he would have been turned away is high? Well, you see, this had a problem. As it stands now, as it stands now, I cannot say whether he would have been turned away or not because I wasn't at that facility at that moment to know their best state and whether their capacity was full or not. But what I'm saying is under proper circumstances, the ambulance should drive knowing that uh, I'm going to this place and I'm going to be received. The personnel on the ground will also be ready to receive the patient. So in the process, there's no loss of time. I hope you understand what I'm All saying. All right, yes. Yes. I get At it. At 37, on that same day, I wasn't there, so I couldn't say whether even if an ambulance was present, it would have been turned away. But looking at the situation, I doubt it would have been turned away. All right. Now, because Mr. Mr. he falls into a certain caliber of, you know, important persons in society. We have some sort of facility reserved for president, vice president within the system. So I'm sure something would have worked. All right. Now, Mr. Ansong uh, Brijang, looking at uh, or listening to Dr. Yang Singh, it appears that then even if you had 130 uh, ambulances, we still would have had a problem. Please, please, I, could, I couldn't get your All right. last part of it. So my question is, does it then mean that even if we had all your systems, all your, all your 130 stations working effectively, we would still have had a problem from what Dr. Yangting is saying. Yeah, I, I think uh, Dr. Yanki just said it as it is. Well, the whole system will have to be looked at holistically. So not just because, ambulances? Not just ambulances. Because the issue is, do people even know that if there's this emergency, I need to call National Ambulance Service? And would they even be ready to listening to the interrogation from the dispatch center because the dispatch center needs to get further information from the one the caller and based on that the dispatch center will be able to know which type of ambulance the person uh, the dispatch center should dispatch to the scene and when they get the patient the patient tablet the patient they must also know where they are sending the patient to and normally, we need to call to the receiving hospital for them also to be ready for the patient so that they can get all the needed things in place. In that case, they need to be informed of the condition of the patient before they will also be ready to receive the patient. So all these things are to be done in tandem so that by the time they get to the health facility, they are also ready to receive the patient. Mr. Brijang, uh, one other thing that we observed in the documentary we filmed last year was that we had some of your officials negotiating how much patients are supposed to pay for use of the ambulance. Are, are you still doing that? Please, uh, as far as emergencies are concerned, we never ask anybody to pay for emergency cases. That is not part of our... There, there's apparently something you call fuel support. That is only for cases which are being referred from one facility to the another, where a patient has already been stabilized and the patient is being transferred to another facility for a special care, or the patient needs to be given special care, which the 
facility that the patient in now is unable to do. In that case, we ask for where support to enable us because you know our services are free for all emergencies. And for that matter, we are unable also to say we don't have any dedicated source of funding. Sometimes it becomes a challenge of fueling the ambulance, not talk about maintenance of the ambulance itself. So that is why such cases where the patient is it's not really an emergency, the patient is being transferred for higher care at a, a another tertiary facility, then we ask for poor support, but not really emergency cases. All right. Uh, thank you very much to you both. Uh, we have been speaking with uh, Dr. Justice Yang Singh. He's a general secretary of the Ghana Medical Association. And then uh, Foster Ansong Brijang. He's a head of operations at the Ghana Ambulance Service. Thank you both for speaking with us here on Joy News Prime. But also in the bulletin, the family of the late vice president, Kwesi Misa Arthur, has told the president uh, the will of the former vice president is to have a simple, elegant, solemn, but dignified funeral. According to the family spokesperson who spoke on behalf of the family, though it is not a family tradition to have a one-week celebration, it will hold a memorial service for the late vice president on Friday, July 6. He revealed the late Mr. Arthur will be buried by the end of July. They were, the family was at the Jubilee House to call on President Ekufado. What we propose to do is to try to meet some of his wishes and his views regarding what has to happen. He wanted, he didn't want anything elaborate or too elaborate. He wanted something simple, um, something solemn, and something elegant and dignified. And so in all our discussions, we have tried to maintain that and achieve that. Um, one of his wishes was that we shouldn't take too much time, but we should do this thing quickly and decently, and we have tried to do that. As a result, we have come up with some arrangements that we want to share. We we want to have a service on Friday. The reason being that we have, we have um, in our tradition, we don't normally have an elaborate uh, one-week celebration, but we recognize the trends in the country. And um, what we would have done was to have the family consult and achieve consensus on the arrangements and announce it on the one week. So, but we will have a service, and at that service, we will confirm to the general public the arrangements that, that all the parties, the church, the family, and uh, the state, and everybody, we, are, we have agreed to go on. So we want to have that um, service on, on Friday this Friday, July 6th. Then, um, according to what he desired, we are eager and we are looking at having the ceremony before the end of this month. In response, President Akufado said the wish of the former vice president to have a simple, elegant, but dignified funeral will be granted. He directed all flags should fly at half mass across the country and a book of condolence opened nationwide. He wasn't a very close friend of mine, but I knew him, had a great deal of admiration and respect for him. I thought he was a very fine public servant. Uh, he's a man of uh, dignity and humility, conducted himself very well in the public space of our country. I'm um, a little bit touched by these, his wishes, for a simple, solemn, dignified burial. There's a part about it where we have to part company. He's no longer just another member of the family. He's state property. Uh, he's uh, a high-ranking official of our state a man who was vice president, who therefore could have become the president of Ghana, is not, with respect, an ordinary person. 
who has to be treated in the normal manner. So to some extent, those wishes will have to give way to the status that he had. I've decided, and it is an obvious decision, that he should be given a full state burial. And as of today, for the next five days, Ghana's flag, national flag, will fly at half-mast here and across the country in commemoration of the death of our former vice president. We're opening a book of, an official book of condolence for him at the conference center that's from tomorrow morning. And instructions have been given by me to the foreign minister to open books of condolence for him across all the missions of Ghana across the world. That everybody should recognize that uh, it is a national loss that we in Ghana are suffering. Not a loss for his party or for his family or for the community from which he came. It's a loss for the entire Ghanaian nation. We're taking a break here on Joe News. Frying still ahead. Death toll in the flats in the Ashanti region now stands at eight with one other person unaccounted for. Just get out and get in and search for her. But at the end of the day, they come with empty handed. Also, to come, Ministry of Communications ordered to make available to pressure group citizen Ghana movement government's revenue assurance contract with Kelmi GVG. Up next, we'll bring you business with Emmanuel Abadjiriafi. Hello again, good evening to you and welcome to Business. The Ministry of Energy, in collaboration with the Energy Commission and supported by the United Nations Development Programme, has developed a renewable energy master plan to provide strategies for the advancement of renewable energy interventions by 2020. The Ministry is encouraging companies to take full advantage of the policy environment being created by government to integrate solar energy into their service stations, electricity systems, as well as position themselves to provide solar energy solutions to the market. Deputy Minister for Energy, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam, stated this at the commissioning of the first solar power service station in Ghana by oil marketing company Total. This program is one of government's flagship initiatives aimed at transforming the energy landscape of our country and improving on energy access and creating opportunities for the private sector in particular. As of December 2017, Ghana achieved a total of 45 megawatts of installed renewable energy capacity. And this represents just 1%, 1%, of our total installed electricity capacity. Our aim as a government is to achieve 10% renewables within the energy mix of our country. And so if we have 1% today, initiatives such as what Total Ghana has done will propel us achieving the 10% we have set for ourselves as a strategy. Meanwhile, the National Petroleum Authority, NPA, says it is deeply concerned about the rate of illegal fuel activities in the downstream petroleum sector. Director of Human Resources at the NPA, Kojo Jackson, warned the activity is putting consumers at risk of purchasing low-quality fuel, denying government of huge revenue. Any licensed petroleum service provider found to be engaged in any such activity will have its operating license suspended or permanently revoked. The NPA is also collaborating with the national security and other stakeholders to prepare comprehensive guidelines for confiscation and handling of any vessels, canoes, bulk road vehicles, and petroleum products involved or used in such illegal activities. 
Now, acting CEO of the Ghana Tourism Authority, Akwesia Jemang, has confirmed in an interview with Joy Business that the Tourism Development Fund has generated an amount of 39 million Ghana CDs as of December 2017. However, some tourism agencies are demanding portions of the fund be paid to them for their activities. Speaking earlier on the marketplace, President of the Ghana Hotels Association, Dr. Edward Akanyamike, justified the Ghana the, the association's demand for a share of proceeds of the tourism levy to help promote their developmental agenda. It's simply to say that uh, we have been collecting that tourism levy for the Ghana Tourism Authority, uh, which is supposed to be used to develop the tourism sector. Now, much as we are interested in everything that the authority is doing with that money, in terms of marketing, tourism, mm -hmm. in terms of infrastructure development, in terms of capacity building, we are also saying that they should also turn their eyes to the tourism trade industries okay. or the tourism trade associations. Mm -hmm. We have about uh, 25 so far trade associations sure. under the umbrella of the Ga uh, Ghana Tourism Federation. Now these are the associations that keep the industries running mm. when it comes to tourism. Talk about the hotels, talk about the travel uh, agencies, talk about the tour operators, talk about aviation, mm. the restaurants, the okay. truck bar, they are all involved in, in the trade. Now these associations are not able to undertake a lot of their activities because of poor funding. But, but before you continue, I mean, you have a lot of members. I mean, mm. the hotels in Ghana are so, so many. Mm. Uh, why is it that you can't raise revenue by yourselves and you want to depend on the tourism levy? Imagine, there's an interesting phenomenon about voluntary associations. I'm sure you have encountered it in several ways. Okay. Now, when it comes to voluntary contributions, it's so difficult to get people to pay. I mean, simple deals, you're talking about a thousand this year, five hundred this year, and it's so difficult for people to pay. They don't believe in your cause? They do. They do, but uh, sometimes I want to believe it's a Ghanaian thing or a human <laughs> thing, oh. that uh, if, if you are not uh, forced to do certain things, then it becomes a, a challenge. The Students' Loan Trust Fund is taking measures to help improve the repayment of loans. The trust has struggled in recovering loans from beneficiaries in the past. To this end, managers are looking at relying on technology like money, mobile money, and to deal with this problem. Chief Executive of the Students' Loan Trust Fund, Kwekwe J. Yabua, is hopeful this development will help sustain the scheme. The ceremony was to acknowledge ASA Savings and Loans and GN Bank as the two firms who have complied with the Students' Loan Trust Fund Act 820. The role of employers and institutions as stipulated in Section 24 of the Students' Loan Trust Fund Act 2011, Act 820, was used to track repayment compliance by the institutions with beneficiaries of the trust under the employment. CEO of the Students' Loan Trust Fund is Nana Kwekweji. We've put in a lot of strategies in place to, first of all, rebrand the fund. We want the fund to be more visible so that people know the existence of the fund and to patronize it. Whilst we're doing that, we are also trying to aggressively recover because the long-term sustainability of the fund depends on how much we recover. He also urged more firms to assist in retrieving monies back from beneficiaries. We want all the companies all the, you know, uh, to make sure we comply with that law. So if a student after graduation comes to work with you, and uh, we are also appealing to those in private sector as well, you, you have to find out if they are beneficiaries of student loan, then you reach out to us, we reach out to them, we make arrangements uh, to get the loans paid. The award ceremony forms part of the company's recoveries and repayment awareness month. And that's all in business tonight. Many thanks for your company. My name is Imano Abwaji. We have, have a good evening. Parliament's Privileges Committee has suspended investigations into allegations of contempt against the Central MP Kennedy Japong following a string of objections raised by his lawyers when he appeared before the committee Tuesday. Five of the objections were overruled, but a sixth one on the constitution of the committee was accepted by the chairman. Joseph Opoku Gakpo has more in the following report. 
Three members of the committee have recused themselves because of the association with Kennedy Japong, and the rules of the House require that the committee be reconstituted under such circumstances. Now, the case will be referred to the Speaker and leadership for a determination on replacements before the case can continue. Listen to lawyer for Kennedy Japong, Afenio Markins, raise the objections. Having granted interview to the press, have injured have injured the reputation of the Honorable Kennedy Japan, and they have further prejudiced the outcome of the hearing which is before you today. We accordingly say, submit, that considering all these, the said members, since they have not had reason to question the publication by graphic, they should recuse themselves from the proceedings, else the likelihood of bias becomes of grave concern to us because they have already predetermined what they think is meritorious and that they have already gotten the media to think in one way or the other against the respondent. That is our first ground. It is our rule that when a motion is moved, same must be carried. This motion was moved. We had contributions. It was not even seconded. And it is a matter of record, Mr. Speaker. The evidence upon which this petition is mounted is not coming from proper custody. Chairman of the Privileges Committee, Jose Wusu, overruled the objections. But one of Mr. Japan's lawyers, Katie Hammond, insisted the case cannot continue because the committee is not duly constituted. You have the letter here in which clearly they indicate that they intend to step aside. Zika, by this standard order, you are to consider whether you accept the resignation of a party resignation. Zika, if you do accept it, and we submit that you have no choice in this matter, because Mr. Speaker, they have written it and assigned it that they themselves do not want to be part of this uh, proceedings. According to the standing order, Mr. Speaker, if you so do, and we submit that there is no discretion on your part, then you shall, mandatory, you shall refer this matter back to the Speaker of the House for new members to be appointed to take their place. Mr. Speaker, with respect, we take um, uh, very um, uh, serious reservations about the ruling that this is overruled because, Mr. Speaker, it is pretty clear you have no discretion. Joseph Osewusu eventually ruled before the committee adjourned, indicating they will meet behind closed doors to determine the next line of action. Uh, standing order says that the committee will determine whether we accept or not. We cannot do that while the witness and others, uh, indeed we cannot do that determination in public. To that extent, we will bring the proceedings to a close. Uh, we will thank the witness uh, and apologize for this unexpected one. After the closed door meeting of the committee, Vice Chair Andrew Japa Mesa disclosed the matter is being referred to the Speaker and leadership for the committee to be reconstituted before the investigations can continue. The rules are clear that when members of a committee, it is not a matter of quorum. Because if we commence the meeting and a, a quorum is uh, in place, regardless of whether some members are absent or not, we can still proceed. But when they write, indicating that they are recusing themselves, there is the need to have the full complement of the committee. Because you know how the committee system works. It's made up of representatives from the minority and the majority. And the numbers of the representation on the committee is dependent on the majority and the minority principle. So it's a, it's a proportional representation uh, issue here. And so to have the requisite balance, I think it's important that as the rules provide, for us to have the nominations made to replace them so we can deal with the matter. How long will this take before the committee? I, well, unfortunately, I, that is out of my remit. I think that the rules make the leader, the speaker and the leadership of 
uh, the majority caucus to make that determination. I expect that they will do the needful. For Joy News, Joseph Opoku Gakpo reporting. The Ministry of Communications has been directed to make available to the Citizen Ghana Movement a copy of the revenue assurance contract between governments and the Kelny, and Kelny GVG. An Accra High Court, presided over by Justice Anthony Ebua, gave the Ministry six days to comply following a request by the group. The pressure group, which has been opposed to the agreement, is in court seeking to set it aside. The court has meanwhile set July 5 to give its ruling on an injunction application filed by Sarah Safoje and Maximo Sametogo asking the court to hold real-time traffic monitoring of the mobile telephony sector by the same company. There is more in the following report. The past two months has seen civil society group Imani Africa lead the charge for full disclosure on the Kelny GVG agreement. They had also called on government to terminate the contract, describing it as needless. Government has over the period justified the deal, insisting it was important for it to monitor revenue. Three rates have so far been filed against the communications ministry, all seeking to either have access to the documents or to have the agreement terminated. Justice Antonia Bo on Thursday granted a request for the documents to be provided. He asked the deputy minister who was present in court how soon they could provide the document. Mr. Anders said one week will be sufficient to hand over the contract. Justice Anthony Abwa gave the ministry up to July 9, that's just seven days to submit the document. The court then heard the other case filed by Sarah Asafweje and Maximus Ametogo. Justice Yabwa fixed July 5 to give his ruling on the application for injunction against implementation of the contract. A family of four children killed by floods at Asabi near Sokore Mampong in the Ashanti region are demanding release of the bodies for burial. They say they cannot pay some 1,000 Ghana cities per body being demanded by the Sokore Mampong police for procedures while the bodies remain in their custody. The death toll in the flood stands at eight, with four of them belonging to the family at Asabi. Mother of the four children has still not been found. The family is, however, accusing the National Disaster Management Organization of doing little to help in the search for her. Love of him, Sarasso Sasaradonko, has more in the following report. It's been six days since floods swept through Kumasi, leaving in its wake death and devastation. Three children and a young woman of the same family are among the dead. The metal container in which they were seeking refuge was swept away by the rushing water. Where I'm standing on this pedestal is where the metal container was sitting. In that metal container was where the woman who is now missing works. So the children were inside the metal container and you could see directly in the path of the uh, flood waters, they were sitting directly in the eye of the storm, if I should put it that way. So the rushing waters lifted the metal container, including the children, and swept them away to the side. The other children managed to cross over to this side and they were held by a good Samaritan to stand on top of this metal container and that's how come they were saved. <laughs> The rain was not too heavy, so we thought it wasn't going to flood. Later, we realized that the levels were so high that no one could come out. Two colleagues of mine later left the shop, one seeking a higher ground for her children. So I realized I could also leave the shop. I saw water sweep the shop. Immediately, I left the shop. I saw them being carried away. Oh. 50-year-old Susanna Mansu, who was with the children, is still missing, and her husband, Eric Kudanu, is devastated. I feel so lonely, sadly, miserable, at the same time crazy. So, you need their help. I need you people help to let me feel at home. Thank you very much. They always get out and get in and search for her but at the end of the day they come with anything handed elizabeth mansu mother of a 12 year old victim is grief stricken 
but me funny say na me twene ho I am saddened by the incident, but I know they are sleeping in the Lord as Christians believe. I have hopes of seeing them again someday. Adaire Kennedy, father of 24-year-old victim of the floods, wants government to help settle some thousand Ghana cities being demanded by the Asokwari Mampon police to enable him bury his daughter. He told me to find thousand cities before I can get my daughter's remains for burial. He said we'll be paying money to some people in the court and other places. Initially, he demanded 500 cities, but I do not have that money. The entire family wants the bodies released to them for burial. Togwe Amaku is head of the family. We have performed all the necessary rituals, but she is yet to be found. Our relatives go out daily to search for them, but we want the four we have been able to retrieve to be buried. We have lost hope in finding the remaining one. No, no, no. Reporting for Joy News, Erastos, Asare Donko, Kumasi. All right, Erastos, now Erastos joins me live from Kumasi with the very latest. Erastos, I want to find out, is there any active search for the other woman who's missing? Well, I'm not aware of uh, any active search by um, state officials, I'm referring to NADMO, but I'm aware that the family itself has organized a search, and so they themselves have instituted uh, some uh, level of search for the uh, uh, this, this deceased at the moment. Do we know if the family has actually approached NADMO or any agency to that effect? Because we had a similar situation here in Accra, and uh, they called on NADMO and the rest, and some way, somehow, uh, they managed to retrieve the body. Are they cooperating or are they making any, uh, you know, reaching out to NADMO or any, any of the agencies that to assist them? Well, what they are saying is that they are not hearing from NADMO. So at this point, I must say that NADMO is conducting its own search and the family is also conducting its own search because they told us that they have sent men uh, to uh, some of the tributaries or where the uh, waters end up to uh, conduct some searches there to be able to find the body. So they are not aware what NADMO is doing at the moment concerning the search. What they know is that they are rather searching for the uh, uh, woman. So they want NADMO to come up clear and team up with them to be able to uh, find the body. All right, now we also know that the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly has been in, in, engaged in some demolitions uh, in the city. What's the very latest on that? Well, they started demolition exercise. Um, they are demolishing uh, some uh, slum uh, dwellings along the Abuabo drain. They believe that they contribute to the uh, garbage or solid waste that is thrown into the drains, which compound uh, the problem when it rains. But uh, that is what residents are saying, that that will contribute less uh, to stopping the, the flooding in Kumasi because they believe that there are certain uh, structures, buildings in waterways that are still standing and the assembly does not have the willpower to demolish these structures. And so what they are doing, they believe, uh, will not contribute any significance uh, to the uh, uh, prevention of floods. They believe that the assembly should rather go to Bokrom area, go to certain areas around Amaga Junction, demolish these structures, and that will contribute uh, further to stopping the floods. Now, the areas that experienced flooding, I know the people were distressed for a while. Has, have they been able to recover? 
Well, some of them have uh, recovered. Some of them are still picking up the pieces. In fact, when you go to certain areas, um, whenever the clouds uh, gather, uh, people are scared. In fact, they start packing their things and staying with friends and family. And so since the rains are still coming up and the clouds are still forming, uh, it has become a dicey issue for people who live in low-lying areas and flood-prone areas at the moment. They gauge the clouds and they move out of their buildings. So you could see people loading their uh, 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 things outside and picking them back in any time it starts to rain. All right, thank you very much, Rasta Sasaradonko, joining us live from Kumasi. In other news, governments has revealed that the construction of the Pokwase interchange and other local roads will take up to 24 calendar months to complete. Sina Minsaya Safuma for Tuesday cut the sword on behalf of President Kufado for work to commence. The project will cost 94 million US dollars. Out of this, the African Development Bank will provide about 83 million US dollars for the rest from the government of Ghana. There's more in the following report. A groundbreaking ceremony for construction of the Pokwasi Interchange and local roads by the Ministry of Roads and Highways is under the Accra Urban Transport Project and is intended to play a strategic role in the transport sector. The project is expected to provide an integrated and sustainable transport infrastructure for regional integration while establishing Ghana as a transportation hub within the ECOWAS sub-region. Works on the interchange are at Pokwasi in the Ganwes municipality in the Greater Accra region began in September last year. Senior Minister Yao Safumafu, who delivered a speech on behalf of the President, emphasized the need for the project to be completed in good time to ease the overwhelming traffic congestion in that area. In our framework of thinking Ghana Beyond Aid, it is imperative for us to have resilient cities with enhanced quality of life, which is supported by a very smooth intra and inter transportation. In the short to medium term, my government is working to improve traffic flows and reduce congestion in our major cities. We have major projects to improve traffic, reduce congestion, and the negative effects of pollution on their health and road accidents in our major center. Designed to fit into the Central Corridor Road Infrastructure Project, the interchange will link Accra in Sawam, Awoshi Pokwase and Pokwase Kwabunya Ridge Junction Roads and also connect to the Tema Motorway. Greater Accra Minister Ishmael Ashiti assured that uncompleted road projects left by the S1 Mahama administration will be completed by the current government to improve the lives of Ghanaians. I must put it on record that this facility is unprecedented as it is the first vehicular tunnel in the history of this country. My ministry, therefore, in line with the government commitment in improving the country's road infrastructure, is also undertaking some other major projects in the capital city this year. Construction of an interchange at Tema, end of the motorway. Construction of 9.1 kilometer spring road from Palace Mall in the Lejokuku municipality to Community 18 in Tema West municipality. There are other major works throughout the nation to improve traveling in our cities. The project, estimated at $84 million, was financed by the African Development Bank. Country manager of the bank, Yero Balder, mentioned some ways the project will help commuters and residents in the Gawes Municipal Assembly. The Awosi Pokuasi Road Project, with the main objective of providing the critical missing link at Pokuasi intersection and help to unlock the economic potential of this industrial zone, boost trade provide income generation opportunities, promote affordable transport services, and generally improve the livelihoods of people in the project area. The project, when completed, is expected to benefit factories and agro-based industries located within the project zone and create jobs. Now, some 6,000 delegates of the governing New Patriotic Party will this weekend select a new set of executives to steer its affairs with acting chairman Freddie Blay, hoping 
to be affirmed. Having led the party to victory in the 2016 election, Acting General Secretary John Boydou announced at a news conference in Accra Tuesday, a lot more polling stations have been added to ensure the process does not drag. Hano Dame has more. Organized on the theme, Building a Stronger Party, Delivering Prosperity to Ghanaians, 41 aspiring candidates have been cleared by the party's National Council to contest positions from the National Chairman, National Organizer, through to National Women's Organizer and National Nasara Coordinator. John Buedu, who is himself seeking to be affirmed as the General Secretary, said 12 polling booths will be mounted for each category of delegates. This, he said, should fast track the process. Station 1, Central and Regional Executives. Founding members, there are 36. Council of Elders, there are 15. And Council of Patrons, 15. Station 2, will be for Ashanti Regional Executives and their constituency executives. Station 3, Brown Alpha Regional Executives and constituency executives. Station 12 will be for Nasara, 804 delegates. Mr. Bodu explained they expect a smooth process despite the vacuum created at the Electoral Commission with the removal of the chairperson as well as two of her deputies. We conduct the Political Party Act gives a responsibility of conducting elections to the party. The Electoral Commission comes to supervise our elections. And we've gone very far with them. Uh, they have a lot of other offices once in a while uh, for, for purposes of the media. After the elections, then you see some of the commissioners coming, particularly Amadou Sune. But the real work is done by people under them. They are regional directors, they are district directors, and particularly they are director of elections. So we are in touch with them, and I don't think that... Uh, because when they, they, they were fighting, we still organized our... Uh, polling station, electoral area constituency elections successfully. Mr. Buedu added the revised and reviewed constitution of the party will be outdoored and handed out to all delegates at the conference. For joining us, my name is Hannah Odami. Staying with the MPP, the party wants the police to go after members of the opposition NDC, it says, are calling for civil disobedience and chaos in the country following the removal of the chairperson of the Electoral Commission and her two deputies. Addressing a news conference in Accra on Tuesday, Acting General Secretary John Buedu described the comments as treasonable and urged the police to act to safeguard the peace of the country. Hano Dami again has more. The opposition NDC, a few hours after the announcement that the EC boss had been removed last Thursday, called on its members to pour out onto the streets to protest the removal. The protest was only called off following news of the death of the former vice president. The acting general secretary of the MPP described the decision by the NDC to contest the president's action through demonstrations as reckless. We, New Patriotic Party, are a party, a democratic party that we, we even protect the right for people to demonstrate. We have demonstrated uh, over a very long time and number of times. But we will not accept a situation where people will decide to demonstrate spontaneously without going through the Public Order Act. And you realize that the NDC wanted to do that. And again, some comments that will also incite people shouldn't be tolerated. Uh, I think that some George, for instance, uh, on his fa Facebook page, I think Kofi Adams as well, based on comments i think that it is below the belt condemning the act he describes as treasonable mr Buedu called on the police to prosecute these ndc members as their comments have the potential to jeopardize the peace and security of the country and we only want to as good citizens of this country to alert the security agencies to be on the lookout for such comments that will not occur well 
for our peace. For Joy News, my name is Hannah Odami. Meanwhile, the dismissal of the EC boss and the two deputies has created a vacuum yet to be filled, with some arguing that there could be implications on the Commission's activities, especially as it has to supervise the MPP's National Delegates Conference. The head of communications at the EC, Eric Jack Pasu, has however downplayed the removal of the two. We went for a long break and we are back to work. And I'll tell you, work is on the way. Mm. When you go into the yard, everybody is at post. All the department units are all functioning. Mm. And uh, I believe same applies to the regions and then the districts. Now you think that's not affecting the activities of the commission, clearly? No, we've all had schedules we've been running ever since this issue has been with the um, Chief Justice Committee. Mm. And work is still ongoing. A lot of administrative managerial duties to perform, some even relating to operational matters such as the um, um, upcoming MPP national executive mm. election. So preparations, everything is ongoing. <laughs> there, there's a vacuum. Right. There's, a, there's a vacuum for now. A vacuum um, to the extent that the three top executives are not at post as we speak. Right. Okay. But not a vacuum in terms of what we have been doing ever since, and we are still doing, waiting for the new um, commissioners to be appointed or whatever decision will come from the top. You know, it's an organization, we have the structures, we have the personnel, and each and everyone has his or her schedule, which are running. So the system is working as we speak now. Now, President Kufado has nominated four new justices to the Supreme Court following the retirement of some long-serving justices. Raymond Aqua joins me in the studio with more on those who have been appointed. Now, uh, welcome, Raymond. Tell Thank us you. Uh, what you know about the four. Let's start with Nene Amegache, and I'm sure many of us will know him because he just left office as the Ghana Bar Association president. Now, he's been working with Laura Samukujatu for a very long time in the firm Samukujatu and Associates. You know, I mean, he was actually the professional bodies association president that's sam okujato and he became gamba association president in 1981 right. so he's been there for a very long time and many said he has trained this man because for the last 31 days okujato has been lawyer for almost 70 almost 64 years so this particular one has also been lawyer for more than 31 years right. also that's the name I got his expertise is really in the area of um advocacy legal ethics and he teaches these particular courses at the Ghana School of Law. He's been teaching there for a very long time too. He has been a consultant to the World Bank on specific projects of administration law. The ADR project we started some years ago was partly due to what he wrote for the World Bank to help others in the sub-region actually promote same. Now he's... So in his case he hasn't gone through the ranks typically being a magistrate going Very through. good. He's never been the judge. Yeah. He's been a lawyer his entire life. All the 31 years that since he was called to the bar, he's actually been a lawyer all through. But he's actually been through processes that maybe judges will go through. He's thought to teach others. He also used to be a consultant to the uh, Ghana Judges, the training institution. So he's actually familiar with the processes of right. those at that particular end too. You do recall that when the, uh, Justice Puaman, Justice Apa, was actually appointed to the Supreme Court, the Gamba Association challenged it. He represented the Gamba Association okay. in that particular challenge. And the crux of their case was that the advice that's given by the Judicial Council should be binding, i.e. it should not be ignored by the president in the appointment because they say that in consultation with, should not necessarily be, maybe, taken by the president. But Essentially, they were, they were making mm. the point. They were arguing that the president had no choice. Yes, that to, to take on the people that... Uh, you, the you know, judicial council advised. You, you know, there's talk forward. about yes, some people who were proposed and the judicial council did not like them and then the president then proposed a different set of people contrary to the suggestions that were made. Now, let's go to somebody who was then proposed by the judicial council, but right. was rejected by the then president John okay. Dramani Mahama. And this person is Justice Samuel Mafusa. If you do, let's go back. And his name has now been put forward again. Yes. In 2004 to 2006, he actually went for, even as a high court judge, he went for higher training in human rights. When he came back, he actually led the human rights court in many of his actions. Justice Mafusa 
has been an additional uh, a court of appeal judge for some time now. He's also been on that particular important case. Remember the Ghana 50 case that was done in 2010 where Mr. Kojun Pieni and Dr. Charles Rekubube were said to have uh, misappropriated some funds, but all of those, uh, what they call it, recommendations, were in a committee report. He argued, as in the judge, and threw out the case against them and said that you can't do double jeopardy. You can't put them before a committee and use the results of the committee to put them before a court yeah. of law. So that was his um, very remarkable ruling on that particular issue. Many people actually understood and got to know that his mouth was out from that point. And since then, he's still been at the Human Rights Court for a very long time. Very important human rights cases he's dealt with and he seems to be the stalwart in our quest for human rights i mean himself justice Anthony Aboa, there's also Dennis Ajay. they are the ones who are known to be dealing with virtually every single human rights case that we have in this country you do recall that when the Buhaha surrounding and i said that he was recommended by the judicial council rejected by the president then the former attorney general and now the special prosecutor had time to say that justice mafusa was highly recommended and yet was rejected by the president then. He felt that that was a very terrible decision on the side of the president because he believed that this particular man is the right man to be He's on capable the... capable. Yes, it, yeah. yes, uh, yes, on being the Supreme Court bench. And let's not forget, you know, some time ago, Boyomi actually dragged Kweku Bako, dragged Antonia Baifa Kabu to court for contempt when his case was running and they were actually making some comments on that. Kweku Bako insisted that there was fraud regardless of what Boyomi felt on that particular case. He recused himself. And his argument was that he couldn't have sat on the case which is running the court that's parallel to him. And that it would be unfair for him to continue with that particular case. So that was also a very popular one. Lawyers debated whether he could do so, mindful of the fact that this was clearly the rights of William that was being brought to his court and not necessarily the case that was in the other court. Now, let me bring in the other person that's also the um, judge in this matter. She is perhaps the only person that people have not heard much yeah, from. Yeah, there's very little in Yes, on. Justice Agnes M. Doji. Now, she spent a very long time in the Ashanti region as a high court judge. She was actually the original supervising high court judge for a very long time. She's an expert on chieftaincy affairs. So when the House of Chiefs were dealing with their matters, she was the one mostly consulted on how to go about some of their rulings in, in, in the landmark cases that they dealt with. In 2011, you know that there was cocaine that turned baking soda. Yeah. She's the judge who actually sat on that committee the, I mean, uh, cocaine baking soda committee. You remember DSP Tehoda? I mean, she's a judge that ruled that she herself, head of the then narcotics, no, the narcotics unit then, and also two other people who were supposed to be in charge of the unit had done some wrong. DSP Tehoda went to court. She insisted to she ought to be, yes, yeah. to be reinstated. Indeed, she was, um, the appeals court ruled in her favor. her favor, but the reinstatement became a problem. So she also spent a very long time in court trying to get herself reinstated. Finally, she was supposed to be reinstated with some form of compensation Benefits, yeah. and all of that given her. So that is the person we are dealing with. Don't forget, she, just like Justice Mahfoussal, the Chief Justice Five-Member Committee that recommended the removal of Charlotte Osei and the two others were on that particular committee too. So, I mean, we don't know whether they directly recommended the removal, but they were the Five-Member Committee that, that actually did that recommendation, and she's been in that for some time now. Recently, there's been a case running, the IFC versus um, Quantum Oil, some huge amount of money being involved. She was on that appeals court panel with Justice Jaisal and another judge, which dismissed the case against Quantum Oil, which is a Ghanaian company, uh, which the IFC had dragged to court on this one. So even though she might not be out there like people thought she should be, she's been dealing with some very crucial yes, cases. And don't forget, her trajectory is just like the former Chief Justice, um, Georgina Hu's trajectory from the High Court, they get to deal with the case, and she dealt with MV Benjamin case, but this one rather dealt with the baking soda case, and then they get promotion to the Supreme Court. But after Georgina Hu, she became the what they call it, Chief Justice right away, and all of that. So that is the first. Let me begin the last one that um, is being dragged from academia to the bench and that's just the way justice uh that Ba, for example got on the bench too this is professor ni asi kote he's a former dean of the faculty of law at the university of ghana he's also been a lawyer for almost 30 years i mean he's an associate professor of law and he's been involved in training mostly for most part of the things he's done in his life and also civic issues and has written a lot 
His main areas, which law students and people have read him know, is land and natural resources and management, environmental law and policy, human rights law and policy, and constitutional and administration law. He's very much published. The standards that academics believe is the very best way to identify people. He has a lot of publications to his name. He's co-edited a lot of the biggest publications at the University of Ghana and also international journals that are supposed to be in there. He's been in Nigeria to be a visiting lecturer some time back uh, and also been to the US and also the Netherlands and the UK, all on sabbatical sometimes and also as visiting lecturer. His diverse academic background. One of the positions that I heard that many people did not know was like, I was also some time ago the executive secretary of the Forestry Commission. And oh. uh, yes, yes. Okay. So he's been in the you know, forestry <laughs> department also for some time now. And he became the acting director of the Ghana School of Law for some time until he left the School of Law, then went into his final sabbatical. He's been drawn from sabbatical to come and now be on the bench. Oh. And now, uh, uh, what tends to happen a lot of the time when such appointments are made is that people tend to want to see the mm. correlation or mm. their lineage. They try mm. to link them to mm. the party or the president yes. that uh, appointed them. Are you seeing any leanings? In this it's way? difficult to draw that particular line. Let's be fair. Justice um, Doji has ruled in ways that sometimes people felt was opposed to the ruling government at the time. As far back as the time the people was in government and the John Kofor, then during the NDC's time too. And of course, it was the NDC that appointed her to that particular committee All on right. the cocaine uh, baking soda one. So it's difficult to really put her in the particular Draw those links. Justice Mafo Sao too, and also Professor Ni Ashikote. I mean, people were wondering of all the, to be fair, pro-NPP or MPP thinking lecturers and academics at the University of Ghana. Why would he Why have to be one? this particular one? Because he's not known to have those lines in times past. But what he can actually say runs through that these are mostly pro-human rights people. They are mostly libertarian in their thinking. And that's something that runs through the rulings of uh, uh, what they call it, Justice Doji and also Mafusao. I mean, if people wanted their human rights guaranteed, putting self sometimes above state, they look up to Justice Mafusa in this case. Right. So even though they might not be aligned to political parties and there's no strong ways of connecting them, you clearly would want to believe that ideologically they are predominantly Never libertarian. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Raymond Aqua, for all that insight. We're taking a break to bring you. And in our recap of the headlines, there is a call in Parliament for an investigation into what actually happened in the last few moments of former Vice President Kwesi Emisarata's life on this earth, with suggestions the health system failed him when he needed it most. The call comes even as his family calls on President Akufado with what he wished his funeral to be like. Ministry of Communications ordered to make available to pressure group Citizen Ghana Movement government's revenue assurance contracts with Kelney GVG. In business Ministry of Energy develops renewable energy master plan to provide strategies for the advancement of renewable energy interventions by 2020. Parliament's Privileges Committee suspends investigations into allegations as in Central MP Kennedy Ejepong insulted. That's it for the bulletin. My name is Israel Lai. Thank you very much for watching. You have a uh, good night, but stay tuned for PM Express which is going to delve a lot more into this conversation of our emergency health system. Good night. This is Joy News Prime.